Welcome to tonight's Writers in Conversation, the first in our spring series of readings and talks with writers. Um, I'm Carol Burns, head of creative writing at the University of Southampton. Um, we sponsor the, um, this event in association with the Nuffield Theater. Um, I'm so pleased for us to be able to um, have Horatio Clare with us tonight. Um, his range of books um, published and the prizes he's won is impressive indeed. He's written 10 books, including several that are loosely categorized as travel books, but I really sort of see them more as literary journalism combined with personal essay, combined with memoir. I mean, basically, I think he just goes wherever the area he's exploring requires him to go. Um, his most recent book, Down to the Sea in Ships, won him the Stanford Dulham Travel Book of the Year Award, and he's going to talk about that book tonight. Horatio has also written two memoirs, including Running from the Hills, which won him the Somerset Mom Award, a novella, The Prince's Pen, which retells a tale from the famous Welsh folk legend, The Mabinogion. And then last year, he published What Comes Next, Possibly Comes Next, a children's book, Aubrey and the Terrible Ute, named one of the Sunday Times Children's Books of the Year for 2015, and also recently long-listed for which award was it? I, I hadn't heard of it either. It's the Branford Bowes Award. It's Branford Bowes Award. Very prestigious, apparently. I'm sure it absolutely. Very, very small. Um, I have to say, though, it is not this impressive collection of books that has prompted me to invite Horatio here tonight. But a couple of years ago, um, I was in the audience at the Hay Festival when he read from and talked about Down to the Sea and Ships. He was so intelligent and and um, clear and um, enthusiastic. And, um, and I thought, I have to have him as a guest. And so here he is. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. Well, that's a lot to live up to. I'll do my absolute <laughs> best. Thank you for a very kind introduction. You're welcome. Well deserved. Um, it's difficult to know where to start, really. I mean, I'll just tell you a little bit about the, the book and then maybe do a, a short reading and... Um, so I was living in Verona, um, and it's you know the city of Shakespeare and Romeo and Juliet and the city of love, and it's all very pretty uh, it, on one side of it. And the other side of it is Verona in the winter, which is dark and foggy, and air gets trapped between the mountains and the sea, and it starts to smell of burnt metal, and it can sit there for weeks. And Verona has a, a hard right-wing side, a lot of the conversations you hear are about uh, sort of money and food, and they vote Northern League, um, which isn't beautiful. And there are bars where Mussolini is displayed without any irony. Um, and there is, uh, if you talk to immigrants who've been bussed into Verona, they'll say the word is that it's the worst place in Italy to end up. Um, and when I first got there, if you saw a black face in the square, they were often being asked for their papers. And it's a, it's a really unpleasant side to it. Uh, and I was feeling a bit dank and, and drizzly, and I just started reading Moby Dick, um, which is a, a great book for, for this city uh, and for all time. And uh, you'll all know the first line call me Ishmael. And the second is when it's dank November in my soul and my humours get the upper hand of me and I have difficulty not joining every funeral cortege that passes and knocking strangers' hats off in the street, I count it high time to go to sea. And uh, I was walking along, along the river and I just read it and I thought, that's the answer, I'm going to go to sea. So I went back to my very small flat um, and emailed Mursk who are a gigantic Danish container organization. They have 18% of world container trade. They produce as much carbon dioxide as does the nation of Denmark. Um, they're worth $24 billion in pretty well profits. Um, and if they stopped their engines tomorrow, there would be anarchy here you know, within six or seven days. Uh, and so I wasn't really expecting to hear back from them. But they emailed pretty well straight back. And I said, would you like a writer in residence? Uh, and they said, yes come. And then they said, you can go where you want and you can write what you want. We won't even put the lawyers on you, which is an astonishing thing for a company to say. I mean, the fact is they've got nothing to fear from anybody. And although trade has taken a dip recently, they also own an oil field, more or less. Um, so they're, what they lose on one side, they were making on another. And uh, so I thought I'd sort of try them for size. So I said, OK, I'd like to go from Felixstowe to Los Angeles the long way round, um, and that's a two-month voyage. It's almost as long as you can be at sea. 
Um, and clearly you, uh, if you've spent much time in Southampton, will have seen, certainly at Southampton Central, all the containers going through the station in that wonderful, slow, kind of self-propelled way they have. And then they get down to the docks um, and they're loaded and off they go to the world. Um, and seafarers say that they take air to the east. When the ships leave, these ports are often very high in the water and you'll see that on the Solent. They're very high up because they're not carrying a lot. Actually, a lot of um, rubbish and recycling, all of those Tesco carrier bags, a lot of it ends up going to China to be burnt or thrown into landfill there. Um, um, it's when they come back, it's when they bring stuff here that they're deep loaded. But pilots who see the ships in and out of ports say that they can tell the state of the economy by the height the ship is riding in the water. Um, and it's been, they said, a fair old climb since 2008. Um, so I said I'd like to go from Felix Stowe to Los Angeles on one, uh, and then I decided to go for a second voyage across the North Atlantic in winter. And the main reason for this was that the first voyage was incredible. I mean, it, it, pretty well everything in this room, I mean, certainly the books, most of them are, are printed abroad. Um, a lot of the beer you're drinking, the wine, uh, no doubt the chairs, the table, certainly, most of the clothes we're wearing. If you could click your fingers and do away with everything that came here on a ship, it would be a very different room uh, <laughs> and, and quite <laughs> self-conscious. Um, so there was that aspect to it. But what was so extraordinary was that this entirely enabling other world is populated and made to work by tiny numbers of men. Uh, and they are mostly men. It's pretty well the last environment which is still overwhelmingly male. There are a lot of women involved in the shipping business, but they tend to be on the management side. There are very few. There were more seafarers at sea who were women, and there are female captains. But on my second ship, when we sailed with a, f a female cook, it was the only woman my captain had ever been to sea with in 20 years. And he couldn't decide whether to blame the writer or the woman for the storms, because um, they were particularly bad. But the thing was that the first voyage was extraordinary um, and uh, beautiful um, and eye-opening, and I just began to understand it. But we weren't attacked by pirates. We went through the end of a typhoon. It was in the immersed at the top end of the industry. And although it is an industry at the bottom end of which there is a black hole of uh, rape, um, exploitation, often murder. I mean, there, are, there is no law at sea at all. There are conventions of the sea, and they talk about the UN law of the sea, but actually it's all down to what captains decide to do, what the ship can handle, and what the weather does. That's what determines what happens there. So if you've got a good ship and a good captain, you're well set, um, and all, most of Maersk's fleet are. But at the bottom end, uh, it's almost invisible. I mean, nothing that goes on out there is reported here. So it's a, a, an astonishing example of an environment and what happens to the world if you have no union representation, which effectively you don't, no oversight, no access to journalists. It's just its own place. Um, and so the stories, and there are lots of them in the book, are, can be fairly hair-raising. Um, and not just because the sea is a place where strange and worse things happen, proverbially, but also because um, small crews of men in extremists, miles from land, things can go very wrong. Um, and that wasn't my experience at all on the first voyage. Um, when I said I was going away, my friends said sort of, you know, rum sodomy in the lash. Um, you know, they're going to have fun with you, Horatio, pretty boy. Um, and actually, it was astonishing because there was no rum because all the ships were dry. So I turned up with a bottle of whiskey for the captain, which he really didn't thank me for because he couldn't touch it for the entire duration of his contract. Um, the ships don't stop in port for very long. Um, sodomy I can't speak for, really, but um, Lash was very slim, too. But what was astonishing was that so many of the stereotypes of my gender, you know, if you have a lot of male students living in a house, it proverbially becomes disgusting and appalling. Um, in, on a ship, uh, in this, this whole ship shape in Bristol fashion, there's a reason for it. Everything's clean, everything's ordered. There's no point showing off. There's none of this machismo that you come across in other parts of life because there's nobody to show off to. You are your role, um, and that's how you survive it, is that you have to basically submerge your ego into your job. Um, and if you've read or if you choose to read a great book called The Nigger of the Narcissus by Joseph Conrad, his first breakthrough hit, actually, and it's got the same joy about it as A Room with a View, Foster's first great book. Um, it is absolutely wonderful, and in it he dramatizes what happens when 
kind of, he's got 19th century man who is a man called Singleton, who is an old shellback sailor. And Singleton is the ship. His mission is to get the ship around. He's completely subsumed himself to his job and to that we're all in the same boat, we're a crew. And then there's 20th century man who's dramatized in this figure called Donkin. And Donkin is capricious, egocentric, lying, dangerous, and imperils the whole ship. Um, what happens on these ships is that I'm quite sure my captain had almost never sailed with a poor sailor because he'd boot him off. Um, and what it took to be a good sailor became quite a strong part of the book. Um, so you are, imagine that you're uh, a young man, you're sort of 23, uh, you've got limited employment opportunities in Manila, in the Philippines. You go down and sign on, um, as people used to do here, to become a sailor. They take you to a college, they train you up, you're gone. You're gone for nine months, that's it. In that time, you'll touch land a few times for a few hours. The chances are you'll be looking for contracts extensions to 13 months and you'll start off being paid you know, $900 a month. So it's slavery in a way, and it's a dollar for loneliness, and they do it uh, in an act of enormous self-sacrifice. As you get higher up, the conditions change dramatically, but that's where it starts. And to carry that off on a container ship, I should explain what they're like. So you go down, and there was a time when places like Southampton particularly would have thronged with sailors and thronged with the stories of the sea and thronged with the cash that they had in their pockets and the profits of voyages, which all would have washed through the city. No longer, of course, because in the 1960s they invent the container box, which you see going through uh, on the trains and on the trucks. And containers changed it all because container ports need access to arterial roads and motorways. They're outside cities. Uh, they're fenced off. They're grey areas on maps. And behind them, it all takes place. And what they're trying to do is make a su predictable supply chain that will stretch around the world and will work like a conveyor belt. But of course, they're trying to do it across the world's least predictable environment. So there's this fantastic tension. And the only way of resolving it, and the ships are extraordinarily sophisticated, um, and, and they said, you know, the next most sophisticated thing up from this is not the Boeing 747 or whatever it is, the Airbus, it's the space station. They're really very serious pieces of equipment, but you run them with tiny crews, 19, 20 men, and they work all the hours that God sends. It's the only industry that's regulated by hours of rest rather than hours of work. Um, and your experience is one of uh, enormous confinement. If you've, been, if you've ever stayed in a Premier Inn, it's a bit like that, which is perfect for a travel writer. You know, that's, you know, I like it. Um, but it's a lot of steel, um, smells of diesel, smells of institutional cooking, very narrow corridors, small bunks, small cabins, and that's your private space. Um, and most of them can't see out because the containers block out the view, so you're just in a cell, effectively. Um, the captain and the chief engineer and the lucky writer got about, uh, bunks on the top layer so you could see over the containers. So I had the most incredible view of the oceans coming towards me. Um, and you eat together, you work together, you sleep, and then you're back on, and that's it. Uh, and half of you are involved in the engine, and the other half are involved on the deck. Uh, and the deck can be horrendous, but the engine room really is horrendous. It's like going into a cathedral, but it's a cathedral made of steel and the engine is right up to the roof, huge things, five, six stories high. They're never silent, they never stop. They throw out an incredible volume of noise so that with ear defenders in, right in, you're still screaming at each other and they don't seem to make any difference and they sort of lip read and scream in the engine room. And the engine will put out 40 degrees of heat, just the machinery itself. But then if you're in Malaysia, you add 80% humidity plus the Malaysian tropical heat. So they hate all the tropical ports, the engineers, for this reason. Um, and then you've got to add the fact that the whole thing tips. Um, so somebody explained it to me. He said, you know, imagine screwing a nut onto a bolt. Not difficult. Now imagine doing that when you haven't slept for three days because of storms. And of course in storms the cook can't cook uh, and you can't sleep. Um, so, and then it's hot, and then you're sweating, and then the whole thing's going 20 degrees one way, 20 degrees the other. Now try screwing a nut on a bolt. And he said, and most of our jobs are more complicated than that. Um, <laughs> and so they are these remarkable people. They have to be. And I became fascinated by the way they carried themselves and the way they sort of pulled it off. And it was about having a professional demeanor. It was about 
uh, I mean, and soldiers talk about it as well. If you talk to people from the kind of elite regiments, it's all about positive mental attitude. You know, everything will go right, and this, we're going to make it go right, and we're going to make it go right with a smile. And of course, they can't carry it off the whole time. And you can imagine when it goes wrong. I mean, supposing you go on to one of these things for a two-month voyage, and you're on there with a bully, or somebody who doesn't like you, or somebody whose family are connected to your family at home, and there's a feud, because the Filipino seafaring community is quite small in some ways, um, although they supply a, a, a large slice of, of the world's container shipping, and that's when things do go wrong, which I'll, I'll come to. Um, and there's the kind of the, the darkness and the fear there. But just in its, it, when it's working well, it is still a, a monumental thing to do. Um, and so you get onto the ship, you go up six stories onto the deck, then you go up another eight stories onto the bridge. The, they're enormous. I mean, you could, by the time I'd left my cabin, walk round and got back in, I'd more or less done a kilometre. And we were carrying 115,000 tons of cargo. The things, it just all, this, all the scale is, 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 is difficult to compute. At one point, we were burning 70,000 US dollars worth of fuel a day and paying, you know, at those rates, the services of the, of the most junior oiler at $900 a month were cheap indeed. Um, and there's no sort of illusion about it. And when you say, why do you put up with it? Um, they say, because that's the contract. And if you don't like it, you don't sign the contract. Um, and I've talked a lot about the Filipinos, and the thing about sea life, which we should remember allows our, our lives to be, is that it's still a feudal and racial pyramid. I mean, there are essentially brown men or Chinese men, Filipinos or Indonesians at the bottom of it. The mid-range were Indian and Eastern European officers, and at the top were white European captains. And that's partly a function of the kind of the history of the thing, but it's also the way the shipping business works. And what was interesting was the complexity of it. So Filipinos said they didn't want to travel with a Filipino captain. And I said, why not? And they said, because if Filipinos say something, white captain doesn't understand. But if, Fili if there's a Filipino captain, then he understands, and then maybe he takes sides. And then, so then you've got that whole thing, which nobody wants. So you feel as though, and there's no drinking anymore on most of these ships, the whole thing seems to go along on a very kind of fragile eggshell. Um, but what keeps it going is the shared task of getting the thing around the world, um, which was astonishing. So the way I dealt with it was I shadowed everybody's job. And I didn't put it all in the book, actually, but some of it was very strange. So we're out in the Pacific. It takes two weeks to cross the Pacific. Um, and every two days, you jump ahead three hours. So 10 o'clock becomes 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And the captain's solution says, well, we shall have pancakes. He was Danish. And I said, why are we doing that, Captain? And he said, um, uh, because it is good. And so that, that was his kind of way of dealing with it, was that you know, there was what was good and what, was worked, and what worked, and then there was everything else that couldn't happen, which is an entire universe of mishap, failure, accident, and death. Um, and so we're going across the Pacific for two weeks, and um, the ship hasn't seen on its radar any other ship or on its uh, more sophisticated systems for a week, and we won't see one for another week. It's two in the morning, it's the second mate's watch. You're a week from land in every direction, except down. And you're, the, the second mate is in charge of the ship, so he's up there, and he's got, and the, it's all in darkness, and it was the, the experience, the physical experience, and the visual experience, and the atmospheric experience was so intense, because there was such beauty, and I felt romance in it. And they weren't immune to it either. I mean, they're not sentimental, but they're not romantic. And so he's kind of keeping an eye, and the ship squeals every 11 minutes. He has to press a button to prove he's still there. And he's plotting your course on a paper with a piece of pencil on a paper chart, because they've still got to do it. And down the edge of the bridge, in darkness, sort of 20 meters away, there's his watchman. And his watchman's job is to stand there for four hours, looking into the darkness of the Pacific. That's it. In order that, should anything happen, like a submarine suddenly come up with all of its lights on, we'll have possibly have time to change course. Um, so shadowing that job became a kind of intensely meditative and bizarre. And then on another occasion, you're down in, in the bowels of the ship and you're crawling around wiping up oil with the wipers and the oilers. And it was the, the sea parts of it were very strange because the sea just takes time and eats it. So you can do nothing about life on land. They don't have access to the internet. So 
or if they do, it's very limited and it causes division, like who ate all the gigs, you know. Um, and most seafarers worldwide don't have it on any regular basis. So you're out there, there's nothing you can do about the world. If you're worried about your wife or your child or any of that, it's, you, you can't alter it. So you've got to be very tough mentally. Um, and they, at the same time, life is ticking over at la on land. So my captain on my second voyage, I watched him as we went across the North Atlantic through these incredible storm systems which were so beautiful and violent, pacing up and down the deck, up and down his bridge, backwards and forwards like a lunatic for half an hour. And he was trying to, he was doing his exercises. And he, what he was trying to do was reclaim time from the sea that would give him slightly longer life on land in order to enjoy it. And he'd done it his whole life. And it was a very melancholic business talking to them because, of course, they remember a time when seafaring was wonderful. You went into port, you were young, you were there for a week, loading and unloading, two weeks maybe, you had cash, um, and it was a real young man's game. And they, they all chortled about what fun they had when they could drink and bring women on board and bring their families on board, and all that's gone. So then you get to the bits where you come into port, um, and some of it was amazing, uh, and at the level of responsibility and how young the people are. So Musk don't make captains much below the age of 50, and they call them the old man. In the Royal Navy, the captain eats by himself still, as he always has done, unless he's invited by the officers. And the reason is that he might have to send them to their deaths, and so he can't be too close. There is the loneliness of command, and it's still enforced in the Navy. In the Merchant Navy, or at least in this part of the commercial container trade, the captain ate with the officers uh, and the writer, um, and the crew ate separately, and we had separate menus. We had a European menu, and they had a much better Filipino menu. Um, and it was all very strange and extraordinarily old-fashioned, but they don't make many people captain below the age of 50 because you need one person who has been there before, who's seen it, who's done it, and you can't fake it. So when they decided to take the alcohol out of seafaring, they had to send the most of their, or a lot of their captains off to rehab to dry them out. Um, and the upshot of this, I don't know if it was true, but, or rather if it was connected, but my captain, as soon as there was a silence, would start talking to himself in Danish under his breath. So whom is it And that was the sound, the soundtrack to all three meals for two months, uh, unless somebody said something. And the first mate eating his carrots, crunch, 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 breakfast, lunch, and tea. Uh, and I would ask a question, and then we would get yes, because you know, what does he, this idiot want now? And, you know, I'm thinking, yeah, Captain, this picture there, where does that come from? You know, so anything I could think of to keep it going, really. Um, and. It was a very odd business, and I thought women would never live like this. Like, there would be conversation, um, <laughs> and often there just wasn't, um, which was, I, I think I was a bone in that sense, because I was somebody to whom they could tell the stories who hadn't heard them all before. But then what was amazing was watching them earn their money, um, and there were particular moments, like coming out of Tanjung Pella Pass, which is a hot swamp in Malaysia, built just across the water from Singapore to try and to effectively steal some of that trade, which is enormous. And it's like turning out of a car park, blindfold, in the dark, onto the M4 uh, at, at rush hour. But it's a rush hour in which you can't see anything because everything's in darkness except for a couple of lights. And what night vision you do have is killed by the things that are anchor, which is showing all their lights. And between all this stuff, these great big heavy elephants are charging. And sure, you've got a, sh a chart that tells you more or less where everything is, but it uh, becomes a dance. And I watched the captain do it, and he was using paper chart, echo sounder, navigation lights, boys. And then at one point, his instruments start lying to him. And we're in a very narrow channel. We can see a ship coming up to us. The electronic chart says, we're aligned. We're going to pass port side to port side as we should. But we can't see his green light, which means he's coming across our bows. And the captain has seconds to make a decision to turn this monstrous thing. And he just says, this is bullshit. He suddenly ignores all of the electronics. He says, starboard 10 we move and we should go ground, we don't. It turns out the instruments have been maladjusted and that's what they pay him for. Um, but then watching them learn how to do that was astonishing too. So coming into Vung Tao, we've crossed the South China Sea and Vung Tao is the port at the outfall of the Saigon River. And uh, Vietnam, like they said, the charts are very old. You know, they're not very good. We keep asking for new ones, but... And so we're plotting on these old paper charts and it was as though some admiral had set out pickets to stop us getting in. There were kind of anchored ships, and then there were sandbanks. And then you've got to imagine you're 23 years old. Uh, you're a, a fairly new third mate. It's your watch, and you've known for days that it's going to be your watch when you go into Vung Tao. 
and there's darkness. You're on top of this huge thing. It's all on you. It's your call which way we go. And as you look out of the screens into this hot, hot, thick night with the clouds low down over the water, all you can see is fire. The whole sea is fire. And as you get closer and closer, each of the fires resolves into a fishing boat. Um, and each of those fishing boats is a crew of 20 squishy little men and women, you know, really easy to kill, and all of them have got families. And you're on this monster going towards it. And I watched on the air-conditioned bridge, Shub, who was Indian, just sweating as he made the decisions where to put the ship. And you've got the hooter going, so the great horn is lowing like a beast as you get closer and closer. Um, and some of them are anchored so they can't move, and some of them are just going to up sticks and move whenever they want, and some of them have got nets down. And I said to, to the much more laconic second mate who'd done it all a hundred times, you know, how do you do this? And he said, oh, well, you know, they get out of the way or we hit them. Um, <laughs> which I don't think it ever happened. Um, but before we'd gone, a, a ship previous to us had uh, gone aground with pilots on board. So the pilots had come out and they take over and tell you where to steer. And these two had, had, had dropped the ball, basically, and this uh, half a billion kroner ship had gone aground and that was the end of the career of the captain, you know. So it was quite a sweaty business. Um, and I watched them do it, um, and Shub did very well. And the way that they're taught is, and it was, became a kind of philosophy for me, was, you know, don't try and see the whole picture, you'll go mad. Bring the radar in close, let the fishing boats come to you, deal with what's in front of you, which is a, kind of quite a good motto for a writer, although you have to be, um, like Philip, quite forward-thinking too. Um, and so I learned a lot, and I learned about kindness and generosity um, and the way that men deal with each other in the absence of women, children, and friends, because they weren't friends, really. They, they had to become friends quickly in order to make the thing work, and then at the end of the voyage, they'd all be broken up onto different ships um, and how they coped. And it was a mixture of sensitivity and humour um, and there were kind of very melancholic things. Like we decided to have a barbecue, raise everybody's morale. And they were asking me for days before, are you coming to the barbecue? And I said, yes, you know, I wouldn't miss the barbecue. And there we are between these stacks of containers, and it's hot, and the sea, the Pacific's flying past, and someone's put some fairy lights between two containers, and they've got uh, a boom box with kind of elevator rock coming out of it, too loud, and everybody's, because they're all alpha males, is grilling their own squid, and, and smiling at each other desperately, and eating it, and then grilling a bit more, and you can see them all just thinking, you know, there used to be women and beer at things like this. <laughs> it was absolutely it was so depressing. Um, but they, they did it with, with great aplomb, really. And then there were strange moments, like we were moored in the Suez Canal waiting for an upcoming convoy to pass us, and suddenly the, the ship was at anchor, um, which is unusual, and the whole atmosphere changed, I didn't, couldn't get it. And I was, so I was hunting around and there was nobody. And then I came, I found the crew lounge, which nobody ever used to use, um, because now they've got DVD players and laptops in their cabins, everybody just retreats into their cabins. They used to all sit and watch films, and there are still, these ships carry memories of what they were. So there'll be a bar with no beer or any alcohol in it. Then there'll be a, a video DVD store, which people might use. And then there'll be a library, which nobody uses. Um, and there were 30, 20 pairs of flip-flops outside the door. And inside, they were singing karaoke. Um, so the Filipinos have negotiated absolutely nothing, really, that would improve the quality of their pay. But they have got a union negotiated right. If there are more than five on a ship, they get a karaoke machine. Um, and that's what they were doing, was singing love songs um, to each other, which was sort of beautiful. Um, and so that was the experience of the first voyage, really. Um, and th there was a very heartening side to it, which is, you know, we're told that this is a small world. And we're so used to technology that, you know, I can send a message to California like that and get one back in seconds. And everybody knows everything, thanks to Facebook and Twitter. And we're all horribly connected. And the planet has shrunk. And the environment's buggered. And we're all, it's all getting worse. And it's total rubbish. When you get into the middle of the Pacific, the scale of the planet is just breathtaking. And it takes two weeks to cross it. You cross the date lines. You have two Tuesday the 16th of October, one after the other. And there's, the air is utterly clear. The sea is nothing still for miles. You know, there, you see a whale, and this other world breaks through the surface. You're going, uh, you know, nobody even knows when that first crossing was done. Nobody knows when the Chinese first made it to the west coast of America. There are mad theories, but nobody really knows. And the beauty of the world and the scale of it 
was breathtaking, and the seafarers aren't in any way immune to it, and they talk about it. And if you go up to the front of the ship, it's silent, because you're so far away from the engine. There's just the sound of the prow cutting the sea open. So it's this hissing, and often there are birds up there, and they ride the bow. Sorin, my third mate, was convinced that they went the whole way across the Pacific, and then he said, and I had one that came the whole way back too. And I said, I'm sure it might have been a different bird, Sorin, but no, no, it was the same bird as far as he was concerned. But it was just an experience of utter beauty um, and, and majesty, and, and that kept happening, and whenever you got out there, and I used to take the engineers and interview them up there, and they'd say, oh, I haven't been up to the bow for ages. It's beautiful, um, and they... They're not sentimental, as I say, but they are a bit romantic. So, you know, there were lots of tattoos, and they could tell you what they all meant. My friend Chris, who's a very big, rotund, competent, young Danish second mate, had recently had these magnificent multicolored swallows tattooed, one over each nipple, and sent me a picture on Facebook. It looked pretty impressive. And he said, uh, I said, it's 5,000 miles at sea for a swallow, right? He said, yes, but the two of them, if you die at sea, the swallows will take your spirit home. And he had uh, a sailing ship, which meant he'd cross the Atlantic, and a red dragon for a stop in a Chinese port, and a yellow dragon for crossing the date line, and uh, you get turtles for crossing the equator. And seafarers have done this since, well, for a very long time indeed. We don't know when tattooing would have started, but it's one of the things that they could get up to, you know, in, in, in the foremast sort of area of the ship when trying to pass the time. And a lot of that time now is passed, as I say, with with DVDs. Um, so, just to give you a break, um, I will quickly <laughs> read from the book um, Somebody Else's Voice. So I was really lucky on my second voyage, because I say the point was of the first one was that it was too good. You know, nothing happened, nothing went wrong. Um, and I know that you know, readers are a vicious species who like action. So for the second one, I looked for a really old ship, um, and I plotted it so that she was crossing the North Atlantic in February. And they talk about the Atlantic as the ocean that is always angry. Um, and also, because of the prevailing westerly winds, if you're going from here to America in the old parlance, you're going uphill. And um, we set out from, um, where did I catch her in the end, Antwerp. And we came down channel, and then we went across. And it was really gratifying, because this was a, she was a wretched old ship. When I first saw her, I said, oh my God, not that one. Um, but it was that one, and she didn't kind of come alongside, she just sort of gave up, and there were sort of spurts of steam coming out of the superstructure, and the whole thing stank, and my cabin was just, it was just like being in a diesel tank for two weeks, there was no way around it. Everybody stuffed their air vents up with clothes to try and close off uh, you know, what you were supposed to be breathing. Um, it was wonderful uh, and awful, and the Dutch crew, the captain, the ch chief engineer, had been on her for years, and they loved this thing. And she'd been built in East Germany, and she really looked like it. It all kind of form, you know, uh, f form to the point and function to the point almost of beauty. Um, it was like going back to the 70s, and the seats had seat belts on them. And I remember thinking, Chris, that's not a very good sign. Um, and we set out, sure enough, and there were two storm systems came together. So we went very far north. And if you've seen The Perfect Storm, um, which is a terrible film and a wonderful book uh, by Sebastian Junger, there's a place called Flemish Cap, which is a sort of, if you're setting out from Provincetown, it's the edge of the world. And we went um, round that uh, to get around it. And I was very lucky, because not only was the weather terrible, um, the point is that I, my conviction was that, you know, they say the sea has no memory, but the sea is all memory, and ships are ghost stories, all of them, and seafarers are intensely superstitious. So there was no walking on bare feet on the steel. There was no whistling on my first ship, not once. I almost did it once by mistake. Like I remember going, and they all looked at me, and I was like, <laughs> uh, but when I got onto the second ship, the captain was whistling Famous Blue Raincoat by Leonard Cohen. As he walked around, I thought, my God, we're all going to die. You know, I picked up and you never hurt a bird on a ship. If you, Sorin said that um, a friend of his had known a Turk who'd found a bird that was ill, that was making a mess over the front of the ship, so he killed it and threw it in the sea, and the next day he lost an arm. And Sorin said, you know, most, I wouldn't believe these stories, but this was a Turk, and Turks don't lie. Uh, which is so good to know, you know, of course, and the guy had lost an arm, so he was presumably 
quite well evidenced. Um, but um, if you go through the North Atlantic, uh, you're, you're going across the route of the North Atlantic convoys, of course. So you're going over a great graveyard, and below you are all the wrecks of all the North Atlantic convoys, which were the ships that kept the country going during the Second World War uh, and enabled everything else. The Battle of the Atlantic was the battle that the Second World War depended on, really. Um, and it was fought by men and, and women, but mostly men from the entire empire, as was Commonwealth, as we'd now call it, um, who were paid bugger all, who were subject to compulsory work orders. In other words, if you survived the transition across the North Atlantic and you weren't torpedoed, you just got right round and started doing it again. And a lot of them were torpedoed more than once, because if you survived, they picked you up, put you back on a ship, and that's what you did. Your social status was to the effect that Nancy Astor, Lady Nancy Astor, suggested that seafarers should wear yellow badges denoting a possibility of carrying venereal disease. So you can imagine how um, these men must have felt, and you're going over their route. Um, so it's quite a haunted business, and at night it was particularly a haunted business. And ships do carry memories of things that have happened to them, if you ask seafarers, and I would say it's true too. So it, when every big port, and Southampton will have one too, has a sea priest, and they will be well accustomed, the mission to seafarers, to going out to ships to perform a service after someone has died or an accident has happened because seafarers want that vibe off the ship. Um, and it still happens. Um, so I still talked to the sea priest in Rotterdam and he was quite engaged in that. Um, and there were strange shadows aboard. Um, and you asked them, you would ask them when you got on board and you could feel it, is this a good ship? And they would either say yes or no. Um, and, and I was lucky. Um, and I was doubly lucky because on this ship, there was the only British seafarer I met. And he was John. And he was from Newcastle. And he looked like this most amazing sea tramp. Uh, he, he was kind of bent at the knee permanently and shambling. And then you realized it just gave him perfect stability in any weather. So although we were tipping, uh, and you, so there's uh, pitching, um, uh, rolling that way, that way, and pitching that way, that way, and then corkscrewing, which is both at once, and corkscrewing was the one I was interested in. And John uh, never fell over, obviously. He could look incredibly smart or incredibly uh, uselessly, uh, terribly messy. He started every ship shift listening to the same kind of dire straits and queen and he, if he's at sea tonight he'll have done it again tonight before he goes up um, and he had a thing called a wonderfully charming tooth and these, this chin that I really succeeded in not describing as looking like a dog's bollocks um, and, he, and I, I adored John on sight um, and we kind of came together and he told me stories John and I sit in the pilot seat either side of the main controls and watched the Atlantic well up from blunt grave force five to choppy and whitened six and back down to rumbling monotony. And we sailed through rain into mist, through gray into sickly yellow cloud, with the visibility shortening and stretching and the current eddying, sometimes a not with us, sometimes a not against. Oh, I love storms, me. Love them, yeah. I've been through hurricanes and typhoons. Love them. Why? Why not? Exciting. I was on a small ship, smaller than this, and she stood up like that. He points his flat hand at the ceiling. We thought we were going to fall over backwards. Chief officer's wife was on board, poor woman. When you go to bed, you have to lock your hands behind you, right? Like that, lock them behind you under the mattress so you just fly off. She hits waves and stops dead. Everything's just smashed. And it's true. You, we did have nights when I put my hands behind the mattress if it would work, and it didn't work. So what you do is, if you can't sleep on the mattress, you sleep on the sofa, and you have a little sofa. And if you can't sleep on the sofa, you sleep on the floor. And if that doesn't work, you give it up. In tankers, the sea breaks over the ship. You can watch big ships bending because of the torsion, twisting like so you steer one way and the bow goes the other. Once I was blind for five minutes, we were coming into the Malacca Strait and a lightning bolt hit one wing of the bridge, came right through the bridge and hit the other wing. Went between me and the captain, just this incredibly bright white light. We had both doors open, it came in there and it went out there. There's a smell of burning rubber from the deck. It left a scorch mark on the width of the bridge. I've seen lightning hit a 30-foot mast and leave nothing but a tiny stump. Captain was right by it. He nearly had a heart attack. Same place, I saw a VLC cut in half. So a VLCC is a very large crude carrier, what we would call a, a super tanker. Half a million tons she was. We were going parallel to them, tank cleaning, and they were cleaning tank too. Lightning hits them, massive bang. When I looked up, the whole ship was just split down the middle, open like a sardine can. Her cranes were in the water. People in the accommodation survived, but not the people on the deck. 
And John curated stories of horror. He had a collection of them. So he told me about another ship that brushes up against a tanker and catches fire. And so everybody tries to get out of their portholes, but they didn't fit, and that's how they found them. You, know. you can imagine a kind of ship lined with heads. Um, and then he, he, he had this wonderful experience where he'd found uh, an accident that changed the whole course of maritime history because it changed the regulations. And he'd gone into a lift, and uh, I saw this hand and then, it, sure enough, and then I found the head. And it was the size of the head, but it was that thin. And three times wider, you know, it was some guy had, been, had dropped a spanner on top of a lift. Uh, and obviously, it had all gone horribly wrong. And he kind of curated these stories, and so he would tell me. And it was now dark as we drive hard into the swells. The wind has been growing again, throwing spray high over the containers, where it hangs in the air like rogue spells. We've had our heavy weather briefing and been told to lash everything down. We should be prepared for pitching, rolling, corkscrewing, and slamming, Captain Cook says. Slamming is the one that interests me. And they talk about a typhoon, which didn't last very long, but you don't need a typhoon to last very long. We had our heavy weather briefing, and there was a steel end block in the engine room. It must have weighed 200 kilograms. I checked, thought, yeah, that's not going anywhere. When I found it, it had jumped two five-inch sills, gone for a walk along the deck, and fallen two decks down. It wasn't too good. And he, Peter was a sweetly kind of patient man. By 2030, we were off the southern tip of the Isengard Ridge with eight kilometers of water beneath the keel. The ship stumbles and rears. Our course is northerly, 282 degrees. Our speed is steady 18. There's utter, utter darkness outside, and the radar is a green and yellow sunburst of wave echoes. As we pitch and buck, there's a feeling of madness, of dashing wildness on the bridge. The digital chart displays its customary caution. This chart is not up to date. Do not use for navigation. Oh, well. We may be one of 600 in the Maersk fleet, but we feel like a lone tramp tonight, running blind. There's been a shadow aboard since the awful news about the Maersk lose this morning. People still sing and whoop, but you can hear the defiance in it. And that was the thing. So that morning, there was just this evil atmosphere on the ship. And we met for the briefing in the morning at 11 o'clock, coffee. And I said, what is it? And they said, oh, haven't you heard about the Maersk lose? And so the Maersk lose is a big ship like ours, and she goes from Western Australia um, all the way across the southern oceans to the eastern seaboard of South America. And so she's at sea, slow steaming to save diesel, essentially for two months without touching land. And if you imagine you're trapped on there with the wrong people. And what had happened was, by the time the thing got to Buenos Aires, one of the sailors had gone mad and had killed two of his friends, or not gone mad, maybe it was justified, had killed two of his shipmates with a knife, and he was in custody in Buenos Aires. And, and it doesn't matter how deeply you search the internet, all the archives of Buenos Aires newspapers, all the websites, that story does not exist. Those two deaths don't exist. Because what happens at sea more or less stays at sea. And it was only because I was on the ship that I knew about it at all. And it happens all the time. And they were terrible, and they're in here, stories of stairways being forced off at knife point and nobody being convicted for the crime because bodies couldn't be produced. Uh, it, there really is a, a, a dark side to it. But at the same time, you know, there's this magnificent, heroic, uh, uh, and, and very beautiful side to it. Um, so it was a, a, a knockout for me, and I thought I would just read you a very quick bit of what we were doing, why we were out there. So this is in Hong Kong. A few of the crew go ashore in the small hours to buy DVDs and compare the prices of electrical goods. Um, we have four, and then there was a typhoon, and we picked up everybody else's stuff. So we leave at Hong Kong Harbour, close to full at 4 a.m., and leave fully laden, weighing 115,000 tonnes. Much of the cargo is meant for other ships, but they've all run rather than face the typhoon, so we've picked up their stuff. We have four cylindrical 40-foot tanks in the bow, labelled Super Heavy Danger Benzyl Alcohol Made in India, Destination Los Angeles. Soren says we have a lot of frozen shrimp in the reefers, close to 1,000 tons. Quite a prawn cocktail. The manifest, which the company releases months later, says America has ordered, and this is just one ship, 600 tons of televisions and phones from Hong Kong, along with 300 tons of computers, 20 tons of clocks and watches, 95 tons of books and magazines, 14 tons of batteries, 16 tons of parts for cars and bikes. American families will inspect 400 tons of handbags, wallets, and school bags and wash with 10 tons of soap. American children will play with 500 tons of toys. American aesthetes may make a distinction between art, antiques, collector's pieces, and bric-a-brac, but we do not, lumping three tons of them together in one 40-foot container. 
For Mexico, we had 17 tons of computers and 100 tons of electronics to be transshipped in Los Angeles. The load of the night is four tons of aircraft, spacecraft, and parts thereof, made in India, most likely for an aircraft manufacturer, but just possibly for NASA. And what's astonishing about it is the seafarers give their lives to carrying these boxes, and they don't know what's in them. They get told what's the dangerous, flammable stuff that's kept in the bow as far away as possible because they need to know in case it goes off. And we practiced firefighting drills where the captain is the brain, he stays on the bridge. The first mate is the fists, which is what a mate always was. He goes down and directs the operation. And the Filipinos are the smoke jumpers in their hoods, and they go forward to do the dying, essentially, and save the ship. And there is... So you don't know about anything else, and they say it was because they thought that in case we steal it, um, except for the stuff that has to be kept cold. So on the North Atlantic, with ice on the sea and the whole thing rocking and horizontal blizzard, my cabin mate next door, Nesta, was climbing a ladder three stories up every four hours to check the frozen shrimp was still frozen. Um, so, you know, if you order... Thai prawns, as we did this evening, make sure you eat all of them, you know, because most of them have travelled much better than we have. And the same thing goes for milk. I mean, we were carrying milk that had been pulled out of cows in Argentina, shipped to Antwerp, so that's a long way across the South Atlantic, and it was now being transshipped back to Canada in the middle of the winter. So that milk was better travelled than most people I know. Milk! And it's not because they don't have cows in Canada, you know. It actually makes sense economically for us to rear chickens in Denmark, send them to China to be filleted, and then bring the fillets back to eat. And um, when you ask why, they said because the freight rates are so low. So that was the other side of this, was it revealed that the world that we live in, as if we didn't know it, has no controlling mind. There's no sensible person at the top making decisions. It's chaotic um, kind of dictatorship of the lowest price. Um, and the result, we all know, is catastrophic. I mean, if shipping were a country, it would be the seventh most polluting country in the world. Um, and they don't like it. They don't like it any more than we do. But what are they going to do? And this is why they allowed me to write the book, they said, was because they said, we are globalization. Without us, it doesn't happen. And yet, we ask questions about it in silence, more or less. You know, no, there's no interaction, really, between land and sea. So that's kind of what I've been doing, is roaming around like the ancient mariner and giving these wild-eyed talks to kind and attentive people like you. Um, so thank you very much. <laughs> in, in a few minutes, um, Horatio will read from his children's book, but any questions first from the audience? Maria can always come up with questions. Yes. I'm crap at accents. That's sweet of you. No, I love acting. I love impressions. I grew up on a hillside in Wales uh, without television. So when we saw television, we were just obsessed with it. And we used to try and do everybody's accent. Uh, <laughs> but yes, it doesn't come... It, it's a difficult one, of course, because you won't necessarily hear it when reading the book. Um, but I do love it, and I write with them in my ear. Um, that's how I try and get their voices, is to try and get their accents too. And actually, being in local journalism, I started on a paper called the Mid-Devon Gazette. They were the first paid-for words I ever wrote. And I realized that you have to try and make people sound like themselves, otherwise everybody in the newspaper sounds like a voice print. You know, it's, it's no fun. I, I would like to have been able to, but because uh, it is perfect for a writer, you know, it's wonderful. But uh, no, I could only really write about what was what was happening around me. Um, yes, and I did do stuff for. Cause we had a, we, you know, occasionally we'd get internet, and then you could do stuff. So I did stuff for the BBC and um, that kind of thing, and, and a little bit of kind of keeping up with life. But it was just a fraction. Um, it's like half an hour a day of connection, basically. Um, so no, I, I, I wrote what was there, um, and I wrote it longhand, and I wrote it constantly. Um, so the whole first draft was more or less done by the time I got back, um, because it, that was just the obvious thing to do. And the other thing was, it's very odd being a writer in an environment where people are working so hard, or sleeping so deeply, um, and you feel peculiarly useless. Uh, and so I think I wanted to join in the work ethic, in a way. And they didn't know what I was doing there. Um, so although we couldn't 
they couldn't access the internet in, in any meaningful sense, and nor could I really. Uh, I wrote blogs and just printed them out and put them up in the lift so then they could see what I was doing, uh, which was great fun because it meant that some of them said, oh, you're telling our story, and then they came to look me up and, and then we got talking, and others, uh, well, one in particular, just spent the whole two months hiding from me. Um, uh, his name was Roy, and he'd had his laptop seized by customs in, in Felixstowe, and we still don't know what kind of evil perversion was on it. I mean, I would love to have known, but uh, he <laughs> just kept avoiding me, and then, because it was making him embarrassed, I was trying to avoid him. So we, we, it, was, it was all quite silly, really, but, um, but fun. And the yeah. Yeah, it was. Uh, um, I, I enjoyed the process of it, and there was something about doing it. And there's, there are sections in the book where they're like, what are you doing? And we're on the North Atlantic, and it's kicking off. Force 9, incredibly beautiful colours and violent, but beautiful too. And I was like, I am trying to describe this. And, and, and it gets to a point where every wave seems to have its own personality. And they're really amazing creatures, and you're being smashed by them, and the ship is taking the blows like a living creature, and the captain is feeling it because it's his wife, basically. You know, it's his second wife, his other wife. And one of the engineers said to me, I said, what would you be like to work in a ship with two engines? It'd be like having two wives, um, <laughs> horrified. Um, and so, yes, I was trying to get it down uh, uh, as it was happening, um, uh, which, which I was able to do because, because of just being shut in there with them. And you wouldn't get that kind of access to your subject in any other field of life because people would always clock off, go home, um, except in prison, you know, and, and, and seafarers in prisons have a lot in common. Yeah. When you posted the blogs, did people say, you forgot this, or you should add that, or did they correct you, or did they... Sort no, of not really. I mean, the, the scale of my ignorance was so enormous that um, some of them started teaching me, and, and, you know, by the time we got there, I, I kind of got what a second mate does. Mm -hmm. I understood it. Um, and so, yes, there was that. And... The, the kind of the, the best compliment I was ever paid was I went up at, on the, onto the deck at four in the morning. My sleep was just shot. Everybody's sleep gets shot in the end. And there was something out there. I can't remember what it was. And I said, that is so interesting. And the darkness said, you think everything is interesting. <laughs> um, but uh, it's true. I sort of did, you know. Um, and I think in another life, I would really like to have been a, a seafarer. Um, yes, I think I would. <laughs> that was a very kind question, amazing, um, particularly actually uh, in the North Atlantic because it was a very high pressure system and very, very cold. Um, and I've only seen them like it on tops of very high mountains, which you must know about. But it comes to a point where it's stars and then in between them there are sort of nets of light, of which are other stars. And the whole thing uh, is astonishing. And when the Milky Way actually does look like milk, um, but they'd seen some astonishing things. I mean, they'd all seen stuff they couldn't explain, the deck officers, like, you know, the cigar-shaped blue thing that left a trail across the sky in blue, um, and the thing where the sky was spinning, there was a cloud spinning, and the water was spinning, but there was nothing spinning in between, um, and stuff they just couldn't explain that was wonderful, uh, and clearly the sea is, is full of it. Um, and that was the other lovely thing about it, was that it's just, it's, the, it's, it's always the unknown. It's always the unknown. Um, so we'd see a whale, and the captain would go, well, I know it is not a right whale. And that was more or less it, you know, if we'd had Philip on board, that would have been great. But, so you're dealing with a lot of, 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 of question and supposition. And then there was one point where we saw a ghost ship, and it was this extraordinary container ship. It was a very strange time. The sea was covered in ice, and we were going along, and out of the cloud, this fog bank, comes this container ship, and she was just... It was like she'd sailed out of, of the Second World War. She was just this dark, dark shape, unpeopled, a slight hardness, basically, in, in between the ice and the fog. And she was going into the weather behind us. was just horrendous. And the captain said, ghost ship doesn't appear on the radar. Uh, and I was like, really? And he said, no, you idiot. <laughs> <laughs> That's so interesting. <laughs> um, what surprised you the most about this entire adventure? Um, actually, what, to be honest, uh, was that, was that um, the book wasn't a flop and that the people wanted to know about it. And when I came back, I wrote it, uh, and I always get a bit down by the end of them, partly because I want to let them go and partly because I think they're not as good as they should be. And I handed it in thinking, well, that's the end of my career, really. Um, and then uh, it wasn't, and people have wanted to know about it and 
people like you have asked me to talk about it, and people like you have turned up, and that's been the biggest surprise. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, uh, Horatio came to our narrative nonfiction class today, and one of the things we're talking about in that class, which we didn't talk about today, was the idea of narrative nonfiction being explanatory, exploratory, and polemic. What do you think? Do you have a polemic in this book, do you think? Yes. I mean, it's, it is wrong that you can have an Indian and a Filipino in the same engine room doing the same job and being paid separate rates. And that's just... They, and they, and, and you know, why are the Danes paid so much better than the Filipinos? And they say, well, because a dollar goes further in Manila. But that was the argument for not paying blacks the same as whites in South Africa. I mean, the world used to condemn that, and now the world relies on it. And that's very clearly in, in, in the book. Um, but I suppose it was just that this question of bearing witness. I mean, we, we ought to acknowledge that the stuff doesn't just turn up and that people not just risk their lives but give their lives up for the stuff to turn up. Uh, and you're sure nobody asked them to do it. But they'd all made the same wish when they were young, which is they'd wanted to go to sea. And then they find themselves in this situation, and it's like everything else, it's getting harder. Um, and they suck it up and, and deliver the goods. And, and some of it's really quite mad. I mean, there's, as I said, there's no reason for us to be taking milk in these uh, appalling, convoluted ways. But it seems that the world economy needs us to move stuff around. Um, and what was so extraordinary, actually, was that, that it works. I mean, human beings are astonishing. So two months after we left Felixstowe, the captain had a date, 2.30 in the afternoon on the 28th of, of October. And he had to be, uh, at a certain point, off Long Beach, California, with 115,000 tons worth of goods. And as we crossed that line, he said, you see the time, Claire? 2.30, you know, marvelous, incredible. And he, to do that, he'd, he defeated uh, a crack pin piston casing, pirate threats, typhoon, multiple errors by crummy pilots, dodgy business in the Suez Canal, and he just brought her home again. Um, and it's people, men and women uh, like that, who make the whole thing work. And you see how it is that future generations, and, and God knows humans are so crap at the future, aren't we? I mean, once in a generation you get somebody along like H.G. Wells, he'll say, right, there's going to be nuclear submarines, there's going to be the atom, there's going to be Wikipedia, and then he disappears, and we're left to kind of just fulfill it. We're crummy at the future, but I now know how we'll do it, and how we'll do it is it will be gigantic machines that go to other planets, and they will be operated by tiny crews of men and women who will follow procedure who will follow procedure and who will be amazingly tough with themselves, um, strong and mighty. And, and that was kind of, if there's a polemic, it's to celebrate that, I think. Well, I must admit I can't buy a banana without thinking about where it's from since reading this book. Or like, you know, it's just impossible not to. <laughs> um, yes? Well, it's non-fiction. Um, it may have it sounded like fiction because I use the techniques of fiction like mad. Um, but no, it, it's, it's, it's essentially a kind of travel book. Uh, and I got most of it in, I think. I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm, pretty, I, I'm quite a busy writer when I've got the actuality in front of me. Uh, I, I do really work hard at getting it in. But I'm a very lazy writer in terms of uh, what would make me better, like you know, deep research and huge amounts of reading. I did about as much reading exactly as I needed, and what reading I did do tended to feed in. I'm quite quick at finding what I, I think will work, and partly because of the, the, the mixed blessing of a journalist's training and background. Um, so most of what happened is in there. Um, yeah, it is. Um, and it, of course it could have been better, and Merce could have offered me a third voyage, and I couldn't take it, um, just because of time and life. But I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to do the Merce Loses voyage, you know. I wanted, and I wanted to be on that ship too, because that would have been fascinating to see if it's true about the echoes that they hold. And is there, you know, because in the days of the Cape Horners and the days of sail, they believed in cursed ships, and there were cursed ships. There's a ship in here called the Gatherer, which is known as the Bloody Gatherer. And the Gatherer's history of running through crew, captains, and mates was just appalling. I mean, Stephen King would have loved it. It kind of outdoes anything that, that he's come up with. Um, so that's the wonderful thing about the sea, is that, you know, fact is really often much stranger than fiction. And I did want to do that again. Um, and I still hold that idea in the back of my mind that one day I'll go back to sea. Um, but it's difficult at the moment. So how did you end up writing your children's book? <laughs> uh, well, lots of travel writers, the same thing happens. You know, you have a child and then 
you're like, right, so I'm really good at going a long way away for a long amount of time, and now I can't do that, and I don't want to do that. And so that's when you get great writers like Philip Marsden suddenly do Cornwall, because uh, you can actually be home for tea. Um, but for me, it was something else. It was that um, I uh, have... I, I've had depression, and I've had the other, I've had mania, and they've both been kind of sewn into the pattern of my life, and um, it's in my family. And I wanted to explain to my son, who I think, thank God, takes after his mum, and uh, is kind of quite tough um, and, and not vulnerable, at least in that way, obviously, although who knows, what it is and how it works. But then try writing about depression for a child, um, and this is aimed at kind of seven to, I suppose, 14. And, and adults, too. I wanted it to be read aloud, because I, I read aloud a lot, and I was read to aloud a lot. And I was just looking for a way of doing it. And I found a way, um, uh, or rather it found me. So I didn't... It was the first time as a professional writer that I'd never written a pitch, a proposal, so sample chapters, none of that. I just wrote the book, uh, and then I sent it off. And um, London publishers said, no, there are no zombies in it, you know. We, we're not really interested. Um, it's all talking animals. Uh, it's all very old-fashioned. Um, but a wonderful press in Wales went for it. And um, I'm really proud of it, actually. It's, it's, a, it's a book I, I'm proud of. Um, so that's how I ended up doing it. It was just because you, you've got to write something, haven't you? Um, and it came really easily to me, which is a, kind of, is a good sign, I think. When they come, it's a good sign, on the whole, uh, as long as you've got a good editor who can say, well, this is purple nonsense. Um, so if you like, I'll just finish with a... Yeah. Okay, so um, you asked about accents. Um, so the, the idea of this is it's, um, it's very simple. This boy's father is attacked by a monster that can't be killed. Uh, and he's a special boy and he can talk to animals, like all little boys in stories should be able to do, and little girls. And they tell him, look, um, there's an owl, Athene, knocked you. She says, I told Perseus the same thing, right? The Gorgon, it will get you. It's going to win. And this little, you, whatever else will happen with your father and this thing that's attacking him, when you, it's all said and done, it will still be there. So you should just walk away and let the doctors deal with this. And this little boy, who's very rambunctious, says, no way, I'm going to cut that thing's head off. And uh, she says, well, that's exactly what Perseus said about the Gorgon. Um, and so he has an engagement with different animals uh, who help him on a quest, really. And this is about a raven. Um, and I know Philip's fond of ravens, so this is for you, Philip. Um, a raven. Corax, the raven said. Corax, Corax. Your parents named you twice, Aubrey asked. He was not exactly scared of the bird, but he was wary of it. Anyone would be. It was huge, with a loud, throaty voice and an accent that sounded as if it came from somewhere near the Tower of London. They were in the attic, the raven griffing the edge of the skylight, its fearsome claws digging into the wooden frame. With its great sharp bill and spiky beard, Aubrey thought it was like talking to a pirate king. We're all Corax. My brother is Corax, Corax. My sister is Corax, Corax, Corax. My nephew, I see, said Aubrey. So what are you into? Death and acrobatics, crowed Corax. <laughs> you know the secret of happiness? Death, the Grim Reaper, the Lady in Brown, the final trumpet, the end. Good old graveyards, cheer anyone up. Anyway, you can guarantee it of death. That's the place to go. Dead people, dead animals, squashed hedgehogs, bloated bodies, rotten sheep, splattered things. Find some of them. Have a good gawp. Now, don't you feel better? That's not you, is it? Under a gravestone, whitening down to a set of bones? That's not you with a tire track tattoo, squished flat, eyes popped and a belly full of maggots? No, you're alive. And dead things are your friends. They fertilise the soil and fill the stomach. You eat dead plants, dead animals. Maybe you don't pick them up when they're rotting, but it's the same thing. I just like stronger flavours. What do you like? I like chocolate, Aubrey said. Dead coca beans, Corax croaked. <laughs> Lovely. Of course, it's harder being a raven now than it used to be. They don't hang people like they did in my great, great, great grandfather's time. They used to leave them swinging on the gallows to get pecked. There's so much clearing up these days, you hardly get more than a couple of pecks at anything before someone pinches it. Tell your dad to go and get a good eyeful of death and a good strong sniff of him. Tell him from your uncle Corax. In a century or so, the grubs they in will have been eaten by moles, which will have died of old age, and been eaten by grubs, and all that's left of him will be grub poo, and that's all that will be left of most of us, grub poo. That's the future, tell him. He will feel fantastic. We're only here for a few decades if we're lucky. Makes it a lot easier to enjoy life when you think about it like that. Makes you want to do some acrobatics. Pit you can't fly. I could teach you to loop the loop. I'd like that, said Aubrey. So, there you go. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, thank you. That was uh, fabulous. So um, Horatio will be hanging around, happy to sign books which are available from the wonderful and independent October Books. And um, I'll remind you that our um, next two writers in conversation this semester are um, Sheena McKay is here on February 29th discussing her um, new short story collection from Virago. And then on April 25th, our own Adam Grace will be um, hosting a dramatic reading of his new play based on research done in the English department and it's called The Teasers. So don't miss either one. Thanks so much for coming tonight. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers.